Hi guys, welcome back to Too Cool for Middle School. Today we're going to do kind of a history video. We're going to talk about the history of Teachers Pay Teachers, how it has affected education as a whole, how the Common Core standards play into all of this, and how the gig economy affects everything. I'm on Instagram and Twitter a lot and I see different conversations happening about Teachers Pay Teachers and some people are operating off of misinformation or not complete information and that just always bothers me so I want to make sure that all of the information is out there and just get into what I've seen as an educator since Teachers Pay Teachers started really becoming prominent in schools. And just so you know, I have a Teachers Pay Teachers little store I don't have a lot in there. <laughs> For me, it's a useful platform to be able to share ideas that people see here on my YouTube channel or through Instagram, and people are able to access them there rather than me like individually emailing things to people all over. I don't make a lot of money from Teachers Pay Teachers. I've never been to the conference. It's not like something that is my main focus at all, but it is a platform that I utilize, so I just wanted to make sure that that is out there. I'm also a consumer of products on Teachers Pay Teachers, but I remember that there was one month where I posted my earnings to Instagram and it was like a dollar and eight cents. So it's not something that I'm getting rich off of by any means, but it is a platform that I use, so I feel like that helps me to explain it a little bit because I understand how it works. The way that I'm thinking of this video is kind of like a paper, and my thesis involves Teachers Pay Teachers and its connection to the Common Core Standards and to the gig economy, which was a result of the Great Recession, and all of these things are interconnected. So in order to understand Teachers Pay Teachers, we've got to go back to the recession of 2007-2008 and understand that a couple of years later, this is when it caught up in state budgets and states are in charge of education and in most places there were a lot of layoffs, there was not a lot of hiring, and it was a tough time to stay in teaching and to get into teaching. I got my credential in 2011 and there was no one hiring. I wasn't able to get a job in 2011 and then in 2012 I got a part-time job teaching three periods a day. That was the best I could do and 200 other people applied for that job. So my perspective is as a teacher that came in in 2012. So I remember a big part of my credential program in 2010 was making sure that all of our lessons were aligned to standards. And I got my credential in social studies and so there were California history standards and so for every single sample lesson plan that we wrote or lesson plan for student teaching, there was always that section where you had to align a standard to your lesson. So I remember at a staff meeting during that school year, our principal stood before us and told us that we were going to be adopting something called the Common Core Standards. And none of us knew what that was. He had to explain to us that there would be new standards for um, the math department and the English department. And I do remember that training. Like I remember learning about like the different strands and how um, a lot of the standards like started with what businesses wanted students to be able to do like when they're hiring people and like what colleges needed from students and so these um, kind of like skills and abilities you know started from the 12th grade level like what should students be able to do by the time they're in 12th grade and then they kind of went backwards from there and took that standard and then broke it down all the way down to the kindergarten level so that they would build on each other as students went through their school career. So that made sense and I was like, okay, okay, we can we can work with this. We can do a whole separate video about Common Core and the standards, but we have to mention it here because this is what really laid the foundation for Teachers Pay Teachers to erupt and explode with popularity. So here's what happens next. Teachers raise their hands and ask, okay, if I am going to teach these different skills that I didn't teach before, and you know, let's say I'm a seventh grade teacher, now there's like skills that used to be taught in a different grade, but now I'm gonna be covering them, and there's just different curriculum in general. A lot of it's the same, but there are still some new things. So they started asking, okay, so where are our new textbooks that are going to support all of this new curriculum and these new standards. And our principal said, well, 
the standards just came out. They were just adopted by the state of California. So there aren't any textbooks yet because there are all these textbook companies that haven't had a chance to like go through all of the standards, write all new curriculum from grade K all the way through 12 and like market it and sell it to all of the districts. So all the teachers are like, okay, so what do we do in the meantime? Because, you know, I didn't even teach English at that time, but you know, let's say I'm a seventh grade English teacher and in the past I only did a couple of informational text pieces and I didn't assess it in the way that the Common Core Standards are demanding. So where am I supposed to get all of that? Where am I supposed to find informational text that is relevant to students? It's written at their reading level. Where am I gonna get like graphic organizers that go along with it and comprehension questions and assessments and quizzes and all that, like where's all that gonna come from? And administrators were just like, mm, well, you'll figure it out. These are the new standards. You need to teach them whether we give you curriculum or not. So teachers had different reactions, as you can imagine. Some teachers were just like, no, I'm not gonna do it. You know, not to throw them under the bus, but there were definitely teachers like that that were just like, nope, you didn't give me any curriculum, so I'm not gonna do this. And I don't have seven extra hours in my day to rewrite all of my curriculum and come up with all of my own resources. And then there were other teachers who were like, okay, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna go out and find all of these different texts and make resources to go along with them and you know, math teachers had to adjust the things that they were doing and they had to work with more word problems and like kind of change the way that they were teaching things. And you saw this reflected on like Facebook with parents trying to help their students, you know, with this new math homework and this new stuff that their kids had to learn at school and it wasn't super well flushed out because again we didn't have any textbooks that were providing us any kind of guidance we just had to go to lots of trainings where we became familiar with the common core standards and i went to like curriculum design um trainings where i learned how to do it myself but i was kind of like I'm not a curriculum designer. Like there, there is a job at the district office that's like the superintendent of curriculum. And there are people who are curriculum designers, but that was not always a part of teaching. And sure, like since the beginning of time, teachers have always like adapted curriculum themselves and, you know, created their own entire units, but it wasn't um, like required the way that it kind of became once we had new standards with no textbooks or curriculum. So anyway, the next year, I remember I was at a new district and we also asked, okay, do we have textbooks yet? And at this point, um, I was hired to teach history as well as English. Because for history, it like kind of didn't matter. We're never gonna have common core history standards. There's no way that states all across America are going to come to a consensus on history standards. So just don't worry, history teachers, that'll never happen. <laughs> That's kind of a whole nother thing, although we do have like the C3 framework and all of that. So anyway, that's separate. Let's stick to English. So I was in the English department at this point, and we were also asking, when are we gonna get new textbooks because our old ones don't really um, support all of the standards that we're supposed to meet now. And our curriculum director said, well, we have a bunch of textbooks that these different textbook companies have published at this point. We actually have like a warehouse full of them and we need to go through all of them and vet all of them. Then we need to pick like our top five and we need to find teachers, you know, like next year that are willing to pilot some of these different textbooks and test them out and have meetings about them and give us feedback. So the time in between rolling out new standards and actually adopting textbooks and adopting new curriculum for most districts, for most schools was like five years. So there's this huge span of time where teachers are required to teach something without any curriculum support. So those teachers who started creating their own lessons and their own resources and their own assessments 
they were doing a ton of extra work and they were probably sharing it all with their teams and with their departments. But it is no surprise that in 2014, that is when Teachers Pay Teachers exploded because by then, enough teachers all across the country were redesigning curriculum all by themselves on their own time and they found a marketplace where they could post it and other people had access to it and could download it. So this is perfect for those teachers who, you know, were overachievers and took it upon themselves to rewrite everything. And then it's also great for those teachers who are just like, I don't have the skills or the time or the expertise to do this. They were able to go on Teachers Pay Teachers and buy what they needed to supplement their instruction. It's kind of interesting that Teachers Pay Teachers started in 2006 and the guy who founded it kind of like tried to work with Scholastic and then ended up taking it back. And it wasn't until this perfect storm that it really blew up and people started utilizing it to sell and to buy. The thing is though that it wasn't a unique business model at all. Think back to 2014, you know, a couple years ago. This is when all of those marketplaces are exploding. So Etsy, people are able to go to one place and find all these different handmade goods. This is when Uber kind of starts getting popular and Lyft and websites like care.com where you can post your services and people can come find you. Um, like thumbtack. You can go to a website and find people to walk your dog. Even like Amazon at this point is becoming exponentially more popular. And there's two reasons for this. One is because people were still reeling from the Great Recession and companies still weren't hiring people back at rates enough to make up for all the people who had been laid off during the recession. And so people had all of these skills, there were highly skilled people who usually were way over qualified for jobs that they were doing. And so if they could kind of do a business on the side, have some kind of a side hustle where they had a little bit more control over their hours and their work schedule and all of that, that was really appealing to them. And then at the same time, people were realizing like, I don't want to buy a whole lot of things at once or like I, I just really want things to be convenient like I don't want to go to a craft market I just want to buy one thing on Etsy or I don't want to go to you know Circuit City I just want to buy something off of Amazon and have it shipped to me so it's kind of a mix of like consumer demand and then all of these people who were looking for these side hustles and these I think just like ways to have more control over your own business and employment because people had had the rug pulled out from under them, even teachers. Uh, there were people who were being laid off, there were like furlough days added to school schedules and so teachers were making less money. I knew, gosh, dozens of people with a degree, a credential, a master's degree who could not find a teaching job anywhere. So you have all of these very qualified people with skills who can't find a job. I'd love to find out actually, I'd love to do like interviews with people. I wonder if there were people who were laid off or furloughed who just jumped into Teachers Pay Teachers and realized from the beginning that they could make money there or if it was mostly like side hustles. I feel like it was mostly side hustles for a lot of people because they were using it in their actual classrooms. They were making resources that they were actually using and then they would just also post them to Teachers Pay Teachers for other teachers to have access to. So I'm kind of fascinated by Teachers Pay Teachers because it's this really interesting intersection of like the gig economy, the shift of the Common Core standards, and then the burden that most teachers have of not making enough to survive and pay back your student loans and having all of this expertise that's not necessarily reflected in your salary. So at this point, it's the end of 2018, Teachers Pay Teachers is a huge marketplace and there are, I don't even know how many sellers, but I'm sure hundreds and hundreds of thousands of sellers. Some stuff is not going to be great but some of it is incredible. And here is another piece of this story that I just think is so fascinating, that there are these teachers with amazing skills who have created awesome resources. And 
I didn't really want to like drop any names, but I, I just want to give you something concrete. Like if you go to Dot Cop Teachings, Teachers Pay Teachers Store, she has a PhD in education. She teaches high school English. She's an excellent researcher. She's an excellent teacher. And the stuff that she comes up with, so much better than anything I've ever seen in a textbook. There's another seller named Emily from the store Read It, Write It, Learn It. And she spends so much time on her resources and she was a part of the group of teachers that um, worked on like the Engage New York curriculum, which is great. I mean, there is great free curriculum out there as well. I'm not saying there are no free resources for teachers. I absolutely take advantage of those, but they are subsidized by some other entity. It's not just people out of the goodness of their heart doing hours and hours and like years of research and putting their heart and soul into incredible resources and just putting it out there for free. They're not. That's that's not what it is. The free resources that I get are subsidized by like Stanford University, for example, reading like a historian or Microsoft for Flipgrid. You know, there are there are big companies behind all of that free stuff. But there are people who are able to take their $50,000 master's degree in reading and apply it to resources for all teachers and they understand like what teachers actually need and the kind of directions that they need and what's actually useful in the classroom and they create this stuff that I think is changing education rapidly for the better. I've never seen such creative stuff going on in classrooms from elementary school all the way up through high school and I don't mean just like little craft activities I mean standards based rigorous creative engaging well made products there are people out there making stuff that is transforming education and making our schools better some of it is cutesy sure but the rigor that I've seen in so many of these resources is incredible and stuff that most textbooks do not have. The other thing is that you can just buy what you need. So you don't have to go and buy an entire year's worth of curriculum. Like maybe your textbook's not that bad. And you know, at this point I do have Common Core aligned English curriculum. Don't have it for history still, of course. But um, you know, sometimes like most of the lessons are good, but I just, I need something a little bit better, a little bit more hands-on, a little bit more kinesthetic to teach like blending quotes into your writing or something like that. So I can just purchase for $3 on Teachers Pay Teachers just that one lesson that's going to enhance the rest of my curriculum. And I think that's something that's incredibly appealing to teachers as well. Because I've gone to like Lakeshore or whatever and bought like a resource book or whatever and there were a couple lessons in there that were pretty good but I wouldn't use 80% of it but I had to buy the whole thing. And it's nice just to be able to buy what you need when you need it. Now let's quickly talk about the issue of charging other teachers for work that you did. I have three things to say about this. A, our district should be paying for all of this stuff we buy from Teachers Pay Teachers. They should be and they're able to. You can do like a, a school PO on Teachers Pay Teachers, but you know that if that's the case then there's going to be a lot of red tape, they're going to be, you know, making you justify everything that you buy. Like. I buy so much for my classroom, books, supplies, teachers pay teachers resources, all kinds of stuff because I am annoyed by all the red tape that I would have to go through with my school and with my district in order to get them to pay for things. So I like having the option of just doing it myself, but districts should be paying for it. Two, we have always paid for other educators' work and expertise. I've got a bunch of books right here that I paid for with my own money. Uh, by different educators who are an expert in something that I wanted to learn about. I've gone to conferences and paid hundreds of dollars to hear other educators talk about things that they are experts in. We have always done that and Teachers Pay Teachers is no different. When somebody else is an expert in something and has produced something with their expertise, you pay them for it. And to me it just seems so sexist that people would assume that teachers should share and teachers should be nice and helpful all the time. Teachers are professionals. They are not just babysitters. I paid $100,000 for my bachelor's degree, my minor, my three separate credentials, and my master's degree. I have a lot of expertise and I share a ton of it 
here on YouTube and on Instagram, but I do charge for Teachers Pay Teachers products, and here is why. This is my third point. When I create something for my class, and I create better stuff now for my classes just because of what I've seen other people do on Teachers Pay Teachers and what I see through social media, it has given me ideas and I've learned new skills, so I create better stuff now, just say that. But if I wanna teach it to my kids, I don't need to write out directions for myself or instructions for myself. I already have that just in my brain. So if I want to make something accessible to you, I need to probably like give you options with it so that it fits within your classroom because I know how to think as a teacher and I know that like some people just have one class or some people have multiple periods of something and so I can I can give you something that could work in either situation. I need to give you instructions as the teacher. I need to let you know how much time this is gonna take. I'm probably gonna write up separate instructions just for your students that you can either pass out to them or like project on the board or something or um, attach on Google Classroom. I need to be aware of the programs that I'm using so that you're able to open it or again, like share it on Google Classroom if that's what you use. I need to make, you know, a little cover for it that attracts your eye. I need to list all of the standards that it covers. I need to write a description. So by the time I do all of that, that is easily five times as much work as I would have done just for myself and my own students. That's what you're being charged for, is the explanation and the layout and the ease of taking something that you didn't make and incorporating it into your classroom. Because when I first started teaching, I did not know about Teachers Pay Teachers and I would find stuff on the internet and I would try to use it and a lot of it was really low quality and didn't have good instructions and it was just really like clunky to use. But most people on Teachers Pay Teachers have figured out and put a lot of time into making it user friendly for their fellow teachers. And since most of them are still teachers, they know how to do that for you. And I know that there are like the TPT millionaires who have quit teaching and have their own like business empires now. And I have no idea how they did that. I'm not really talking about them. I'm more just talking about people who are current teachers working in the classroom and have a little side hustle of sharing their best, most engaging lessons that they're proud of with other people because they know that they work in the classroom. One other huge thing, and this is definitely its own separate video as well, but like teacher social media has also contributed hugely to the popularity of Teachers Pay Teachers. And before there was like teacher YouTube, which I always feel like I kind of started, um, teacher Instagram, teachers on Snapchat and all that kind of stuff. There were teacher blogs and people often would share their lessons and their resources on their teacher blogs for free, but they had control over their website. They could get like ad revenue through their, their blog site. And then the only thing about those blogs is that you couldn't go there for everything. Like, you know, you, you would, keep up on that teacher's blog and you would have to find somebody else that also taught second grade or that also taught middle school English or whatever and you'd go to those specific blogs and every so often they would post something that you could use but on Teachers Pay Teachers you can just do a search and like crowdsource everything that you need so there's going to be 25 different resources on how to blend quotes into writing and you can choose the one that you want. So there's definitely an aspect of being a responsible consumer as well and making sure that you read descriptions and read the feedback and all that kind of stuff also. And absolutely Pinterest and I would say Pinterest and Instagram are what really drive up people's um, teachers pay teachers sales because that's where we're looking for ideas. I mean um, even back in the day, like the, the early days of adopting Common Core, that's what people would do. Like as teachers we would sit around and go on Pinterest and joke about how this should be professional development. I just remember going through these shifts in philosophy with different departments. I remember with the history department just like laboring through uh, a new way of having our students respond to questions and not just regurgitating answers from the textbook, but including evidence, making a claim, elaborating upon that evidence. And I think that it's great. I think the Common Core standards in general are a much better way to think and to teach. But it was definitely a shift 
and there were definitely new skills that students were adopting and that first teachers needed to have and it's great that we've got these like worldwide platforms like Instagram and Pinterest and YouTube and then now Teachers Pay Teachers where people can share all of these ideas and you can see what everyone else is doing. So in conclusion, the adoption of the Common Core standards without any textbooks or curriculum facilitated a need for teachers to make their own resources and illuminated the fact that teachers are actually experts and great at doing curriculum design, even better a lot of times than some of the textbook companies. And this intersected with the rise of the gig economy and consumer demand for easily downloadable products in every facet of our lives. And you have this perfect storm that created the rise of Teachers Pay Teachers. I would also argue that it is improving education as a whole and that it's shining light on the fact that so many teachers are great at curriculum writing and great at curriculum design. And not all of us have access to like a publishing company to publish our book or to a textbook company where we could get hired and you'd have to quit your teaching job anyway. So this has opened up avenues to any teacher with Wi-Fi and PowerPoint <laughs> to be able to create engaging and rigorous resources. And I just think this is fascinating from like a historical standpoint and just from like the history of education. Like we are going to look back at this time and see that there was a monumental shift in education and all of these things were contributing factors. I know that there are a lot of Teachers Pay Teachers haters out there and you are free to leave any comments that you would like or if you see any other uh, connections or any other reasons why you think that Teachers Pay Teachers became so popular, let me know below. I'm just interested in this phenomena in general. So anyway, I already said in conclusion like a full minute ago, so we're gonna be done. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for watching. Feel free to share this with friends and colleagues and discuss what you think about these shifts in education. And I'd love to hear your thoughts. So thank you again for watching. Bye.